If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 27. Now, we are going to um, uh, read this chapter, but um, as we do, um, turn back just a page or two to Acts chapter 23, and you'll remember uh, last week we, um, we were in this chapter, and in Acts 23, verse 11, Acts 23, verse 11, the Lord speaks to Paul. Paul had really made a big mistake and he's um, he's really somewhere God did not intend him to be but he's, he's realized that and um, he's um, gotten things right with the Lord and in verse 11 of Acts 23 here's what you see and the night following the Lord stood by him and said be of good cheer Paul for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem so must thou bear witness also at Rome and so the next few chapters, and uh, they just take you to that journey in chapter 27. Uh, Paul is on a ship. Uh, he's a prisoner, and he is headed to Rome. So he is on his way towards the spot that God said he would be. So let's start there in verse 1 of Acts 27. And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy... They delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus band. And entering into a ship of Adramidium, we launched, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. And the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go into his friends to refresh himself. And when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. And when we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against Nidus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Salmoni, and hardly passing it, came into a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was the city of Lycia. And when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Phoenice and there to winter, which is in haven of Crete and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurocladon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, strike sail, and so were driven. And we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. And the third day we cast out with their own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. 
But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. How be it? We must cast upon a certain island. Let's pray. Lord, help us as we look at this text. We pray that you would make it fitting and applicable, Lord, uh, to everyone in this room. Lord, that people would hear your voice. They would see something in this passage, Lord, that would help them for your glory. And God, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, um, Paul is now on his way to Rome, and he is on his way to the Gentiles. You know, one of the things that got Paul in trouble was um, uh, how much he he loved his countrymen. And um, everywhere he went, uh, you know, you see in those early places in the book of Acts, he's often in the synagogue, and he's often dealing with the Jews. And um, uh, Paul said in the book of Romans, he said, I could wish myself accursed uh, for my brethren. Uh, he he so loved the Jewish people, but that was not his mission. That was not his mandate. Um, from the first day he was saved, God said, I will send you to the Gentiles. And, uh, and he did that on the way, but so often he would get you know, tangled up with the Jews. And, and, and of course, um, that's what had put him in Jerusalem against the warning of Agabus by the Holy Ghost. Agabus said, do not go to Jerusalem. And uh, Paul had wound up there. And that's why now Paul is a prisoner on a ship. And um, Paul is on his way to Rome. He is back on track. He is on a detour. It is a self-inflicted detour, but he is back on track. You know, um, a, a man long ago said, it, it doesn't take long to get back in the will of God. Um, you know, years ago, we preached a message called It's a Short Distance. And uh, we talked about uh, how it was 11 days journey from the crossing of the Red Sea to Kadesh Barnea, which was, it was 11 days from when they left Egypt to the place where they could have crossed into the promised land. Now, God purposely for that first year after they left Egypt, he took them on a detour and he sort of took them around and, and he was very patient and he, he kept them from seeing much war that first year. But finally, they got to Kadesh Barnea and um, that was the place where they were supposed to cross and go into Jericho. And, uh, and man, by the time they got there... Um, they sent those 12 spies in and they came back with that evil report. They discouraged the hearts of the children of Israel. And in the past year now, the children of Israel had majorly provoked the Lord over and over and over and over. And so suddenly the Lord said, no. He said, um, I'm not going to let you guys go into the promised land. He said, he said, my promise is going to be breached. He was still going to keep his promise, but it was going to be delayed. He said, you guys are not going to get to see the fulfillment of my promise. But he said, but your children will, who you who you blamed your fear on. He said, uh, he said I'm going to let them see it. And so they wandered 40 years. Can you imagine it? They wandered on foot 40 years in a place that it only takes 11 days to cross. I bet they saw a lot of familiar territory over and over and over. You know, one of the little kids, Daddy, have, have we been here before? That rock looks familiar. Well, yeah, they, they went round and round and round. And, you know, that's a picture of what a lot of God's people do. Uh, they go round and round and round. Uh, I've been reading back in, the, in those pastures again, and twice on two separate occasions, the Lord looks at His people and He says, You have compassed this mountain long enough. He said, Man, you went round and round. This. He said, It's time to move on. You know, the blessing here is that, uh, and, and this old man of God said it years ago, he said, you can be out of the will of God. You can really mess up like Paul did. You can wind up on a big detour and it was going to cost Paul four years of his life in captivity. 
he was still going to do the Lord's work, but the Lord never intended that he would spend those four years in captivity. But nevertheless, if we confess our sins, Amen. he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And thank God he doesn't make us crawl on broken glass. You don't have to atone for your sins. Jesus did that on the cross. He took the punishment. You don't have to beat yourself. Boy, that's another thing people are good at doing. People are often haunted by their past. But you can get back on track. You can get back on the path, actually, very quickly. In your heart, the moment you turn back to God, the moment you get it right, the moment you drop that thing that you never should have picked up, the moment that you really mean business with God, you're back on the path. And he, He's there with you. And, and the windows of heaven, His communication, everything's open again. But this old man said, he said, uh, he said, you can be back in the will of God in a moment. But he said, but it may take you a little while to get there geographically. You know, it might take you a little while before, you know, you're back in that place where you're thinking, okay, I'm back in the bullseye and, and the situation, the people, every, I'm, I'm back exactly where I'm supposed to be. That, that may take you a little while. Paul is on a detour. Paul was back on the will of God, but he was... He was on a detour, but he was in the will of God. And the amazing thing is what happens in this chapter. In this chapter, Paul winds up in a terrible storm, but it's not because he's backslid. It's not because anything's wrong. He is in the will of God. I want to ask you this morning, are you in the will of God? Of course, you know that... That's not even a question until you know that that you are saved by the grace of God, that you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, that you've turned to him. You've turned from your way. You, and there's a definite moment, a definite hour somewhere in that in your past. You knew Jesus Christ died for your sins and he was buried and he rose the third day. And you opened your heart to him and you received him. You called on his name and he became your Savior. Remember one time I was talking to somebody and um, and um, they were wanting to be saved. And, and so, you know, we're just taking the Bible and showing them. And I said, um, do you believe Jesus died for you? And they said, well, I, I believe he died for the world. Well, that, that's good. That, that's part of it. But you've got to come to the place where he died for you. And that's, that's, that's when a person becomes a believer. That's when they're saved, when they, when they embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so you, that's where that whole thing begins. But as a believer, being in the will of God, what does that mean? Um, you know, the, the Lord said in one place, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. Um, it, it simply means that um, you're, you're willing, uh, you have deliberately chosen to begin to align your life as best you know how. And man, our, we grow in our understanding of all that as we read the Bible. But as best you know how, you begin to align your life to what God wants for you. you. You can go your own way. And that's the picture of a lost man. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. But salvation is when you abandon your way and you turn his way. And as a believer, being in the will of God simply means that you're still aligning your life in line with his will. You know, the first thing that Saul said when he saw Jesus on the Damascus road, he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me? Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And man, that, that question, that question put him on a path. You know, Paul said towards the end of his life, he said, I have not attained, but he said, but I follow after. Being in the will of God is, is not always something maybe that is a is something that um, 
you can perfectly just say at every moment I'm there. And yet it is something if you're in the will of God, you're pursuing it. You're how do you know if you're in the will of God? I, are you pursuing that? Does it matter to you? Uh, do you do you get up today and you think, man, I, I want to do what God wants me to do, to do today? Paul was back in the will of God and Paul encounters a great storm and it was the worst, one of the worst he had ever seen. And as you read the story, it really was an incredible storm. And again, I want to say it was in the will of God. He was on the right path and he encounters the storm of his life. And the Holy Ghost takes a lengthy chapter and gives us a lot of details. There's a lot that the Lord wants us to notice here. One of the things that the Lord brings out in this chapter is um, in verse three. One of the key players in this story is the centurion. And the next day we touched at Sidon and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go into his friends. You see in verse one, he was a centurion of Augustus band. A centurion was a Roman soldier that was in charge of a hundred men. You see this uh, centurion was, he was a, a, a kind centurion. Now, you know, you wouldn't be in that position, a soldier, you know, um, uh, they're rough and tough and and hard as nails. And they have to be. And yet. Paul is placed into his charge. And, and as you read on in this chapter, you read also that there was many, many prisoners on this ship. And so the centurions are guarding these soldiers. And for a Roman soldier. If your prisoner got away, you died in his place. I mean, it was a serious thing. Um, I, I would think that would make you very cautious with your prisoners. Um, but he, in verse 3, lets Paul go to his friends and to refresh himself at one point on this journey when they're um, uh, in one particular place. You know, he saw that Paul was obviously different. And throughout this chapter, you see that the centurion is observing Paul. And before this chapter is over, he comes to a place of very ultimate trust in Paul. But though he was very kind to Paul, he did not believe Paul. Look at verse 9. Now, when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed. Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and, sh lading and the ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. You know, in, in a way, in a way that makes perfect sense. You know, it, it uh, uh, who is Paul? You know, well, he's a, he's a Jew. He's a prisoner. Um, he's, uh, you know, known for, you know, the reason he's in bonds is because of this message he's been preaching. Um, his specialty is not uh, ships or sailing or anything else. But you and I both know that Paul lived in touch with the Lord. And, um, and you know, when you, when you try to live in the will of God, God does give you some sense of some things. And uh, Paul just had a feeling this was not going to go well. So he speaks to the centurion. He speaks to the, uh, the owner of the ship, the master of the ship. And um, the centurion was very kind to Paul. But he did not believe Paul. You know, a lot of people are like that when it when it comes to their life. You know, um, kids sometimes are like that with their parents. I, I realize some parents are just, and I say this kindly, some of them, they're just a disaster. That's that's there's no other way to say it. They're 
they're inconsistent, they're up and down, they're, um, you know, and, and, and they're just, just a mess. And, um, and yet there are other parents that, that aren't that way. Uh, I think of the story of, um, Oh, I can't. Her name escapes me. Hannah Hernard. Hannah Hernard became a famous missionary um, back in the early 1900s, and and uh, we've talked about how she became a believer. and And um, she grew up in a good Christian home. She said, "You know what?" She said, "Christianity was not real to me." She said, um, "I grew up in church. I grew up in a gospel preaching church." She said, "I wanted to believe." She said, "I wanted it to be real to me." But she said, but for some reason, she said, no matter what I did, it never was real to me. And she said, but I couldn't blame that on my parents. She said, my parents love the Lord. She said, just the way my mother said the words, the lovely Lord Jesus. She said, you knew when she said those words. She said, I, I knew he was real to them. And yet all their uh, as she was growing up, all their their words and all their encouragement and, you know, every time they tried to deal with her and every time they tried to explain things to her and every time they tried to clear up the fog. You know what? She loved her mom and dad. But um, it just wasn't real to her. And that's where this centurion is. He he obviously sees Paul's different. He he likes Paul. He's Paul is not like the others in. And Paul is sincere and Paul is very intelligent. Uh, Paul is very educated, but he's, he's not, he's not a sailor. And Paul says, look, Julius, he said, I, I got a really bad feeling about this trip. And Centurion, Julius listens and, and he talks to the, the master of the ship and all that. And he says, well, you know, Paul, you know, I, I appreciate your, uh, I appreciate your advice. I, I appreciate your concern. Boy, how many times have you heard those words? I appreciate your concern. But if you don't mind, we'll just do what we were going to do anyway. Verse 13. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete, supposing. You know, they supposed it because the south wind blew softly. The south wind has always been associated with warm weather and and um, nice weather. And, uh, you know, up here we love the south wind when it blows. And, you know, uh, they, they, they check the wind. And as a believer, it's always... It's not a good thing to check the wind. And the, the circumstances looked favorable. It said the south wind blew softly. Well, that sounds cozy, doesn't it? It blew softly. It was warm and fuzzy. It was tropical. It was almost romantic. But you know what that wind was going to do? It was going to set them up for the kill. You know, as a believer, the question never is, which, which way is the wind blowing? Whether that be the political wind or the evangelical wind or the Baptist wind, it, it doesn't matter. Boy, those winds change. The question is never which way the wind is blowing. Rather, the, que the question should be, one of the questions should be, what time is it? Look at verse 9. Now, when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already past, Paul admonished them. Um, this would have been right at the beginning of the month of November. And from October to November, there was a change in the weather and the sailing became dangerous in that part of the world between October and November and they absolutely would not sail by mid-November. From November until February, they would not sail because it was so dangerous to sail. And they knew that. And this was, when was, what time was it? It was, 
It was early November, but you know, they had places to go and people to see and money to make. I wonder if we can, wonder if we can sneak this trip in. Wonder if this, this is south wind. Maybe, maybe we got, maybe we got another week of nice weather. That's what we keep praying for right now. Lord, one more week, (laughs) one more week, one more week. And we got some people, I know they've been praying because it's like, I look at the weather one more week. Yes. We got some people know how to pray in here. Praise the Lord. <laughs> but you know what? They were going to sail. Now listen to me. And they knew better. Paul goes up. Now you think it, it seems ludicrous. It seems ridiculous that Paul would go to the master of the ship and say, Captain, you know this is going to be a bad trip. And the captain goes, he looks at his chains and says, uh, which, ship, uh, which ship did you just sink? It looks like you just got arrested. And he says, Captain, I'm telling you. And he says, who are you? And Paul says, Captain, it's November 1. And the captain knew what that meant. The captain knew better. But you know, they had this little meeting. And you know what the outcome of the meeting was? Paul, we we appreciate your concern, Paul. But we'll take our chances. Have you ever heard those words? Have you ever thought those words? Those are the words of a fool. I'm a preacher, I... Yeah, I realize Jesus might be the only way, you know, I realize, you know, and I hear what you're saying, but if you don't mind, I'll just take my chances. Well, yeah, I know a lot of these people do these drugs and some of them lose their mind and some of them have memory problems. But if you don't mind, just just keep it to yourself. We'll just take our chances. Well, I I know he's not saved and I'm saved and we're going to get married, but if you don't mind, if you just keep your nose out of this, we'll just take our chances. You know why? The wind's blown softly. It just seems so romantic. Hello? All hell's going to break loose shortly. Just so you know. Just so you know. And the fact is, in your heart of hearts, they know better. But just something about that soft wind and that soft music and that stupid romantic movie they just watched, and it just feels so... And you know better. You know that's not reality. You know that. You know how it's played out for everybody that's ever walked that road. But you're just going to take your chances. A storm is coming. The question never is which way is the wind blowing? The question should be what time is it? Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. What time is it? Oh, it's late. The hour's late. Jesus is coming. That hour is near. You shouldn't be going, well, what's everybody going to think? That means which way is the wind blowing? You ought to look at your watch and go, wow, this is 2023. It's getting late. The other question you ought to ask is, what have holy men of God said? In Second Peter, it says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And that's a reference to the word of God. You know, the, the question ought to be, you know, you know, it, it, would, it, would it really hurt you? Would it really hurt you to open your Bible? I, I just marvel sometimes at the people that, that they do something, they adopt some position, they, they justify some crazy behavior, and they're believers. Now, I, if they got saved yesterday, man, we totally understand. You know, they're just growing. Got it. 
understand. But people in our kind of churches that have grown up around this and they've heard it, heard it, heard it, heard it. They've read it. They've memorized it. And uh, and you're going, wait a minute. You know, what you're justifying, what you're doing. Um, have you looked lately to see, would it hurt you to take 20 minutes and just look at what the Bible says? Do you ever ask your, yourself the question, well, preacher, I just know how I feel about this. And you know what? You know, um, I'm just not going to let them run over me. And, and I've just done this. And I grew up this way. And So the wind was blowing the wrong direction half your life. I, I don't care which way that wind was blowing. I want to know. Show me what the Bible says. Then I'll be convinced. What does the Bible say? It's not hard to find out. Did you know the wind can change? Boy, that soft wind was blowing and it was just so nice. They probably had a little, little orchestra on board and they were playing some nice music, you know. And um, somebody was sitting there with their, with their, you know, cruising hat on and sipping their lemonade. Look at verse 14. But not long after, yep, 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 just about the time you're committed, you know, you've gone too far to get out of this one. But not long after, there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurocladon. And when the ship was caught, just, you know, you what strange wording it it's the thought of like when you're caught in a trap you know that the wind got it there was an outside force now that had grabbed that ship the wind had changed the wind can take control and the wind was going to carry that ship to shipwreck by the end of this chapter i mean by the end of this chapter that ship was not even going to exist by the end of this chapter that ship is a bunch of broken wood all over the ocean Verse 14, but not long after it, there arose against it a tempestuous wind. You know what a tempest is? Uh, it's amazing what you find when you look in the dictionary. The word tempest is the worst of all the winds. The winds are rated in four categories. There is a breeze, and there is a gale, and there is a storm, but then there's a tempest. And the tempest is the worst wind of all. And they were caught. You know what that means? Now, now, now there was the, the time for decision making was passed. I mean, they were committed. It was out of control. It was out of control. Pastor, I appreciate your concern. And I say, Pastor, it could be mom or dad. Mom or dad, you know, I, I, I know you're just trying to take care of me. But yeah. Yeah, it won't be long. It'll be out of control. Verse 20. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appear, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. Well, in the midst of this storm, there was one man on board that was in the will of God. And his name was Paul. Paul was not perfect. Paul had just made one of the greatest blunders of his life. And Paul loved the Lord. And, um, and you know what you find there? It, it seemed that all was lost. He said, for many days, for many days, that, that ship is just rocking all over the sea. They don't see the sun. They don't see the stars at night. And Paul said, and, and it's interesting, the word we. All hope that we should be saved was taken away. It seemed like it was all over. And even Paul himself, you know, what Paul thought, I'm, I'm guessing, of course, but I, I, the Bible says these people were just like us. Elias was a man subject to like passions we are. I think Paul is caught in that storm. And Paul is going, uh, now remember, we started in chapter 23, where Paul, God appears to Paul and says, 
Paul, uh, be of good cheer as you have testified of me at Jerusalem. You must also bear witness of me at Rome. And all of a sudden, after several days, the Bible says many days. And when the Bible uses the term many days, it is an extended period. You know what Paul's thinking? Paul's thinking, wow, did, did I misread that message from the Lord? Did I imagine it? Maybe God has changed his mind and maybe he's decided I'm going to go down with the ship. It seemed that it was over. Um, you know, I don't know where you're at this morning, but I do know this. If you love the Lord, uh, man, there's there's good times and there's other times. And there's times when it's uh, it's just um, it's troubling. It's stormy. And, um, you know, you, you can get in this place. Uh, the other day, one of the guys was talking and Paul said um, he said in one place, he said, we are perplexed. We are perplexed and perplexed means uh, you don't know which way is up. Um, you know, you can be doing right. You can be praying. You can be reading your Bible. You can be trying to do the right thing. And um, and man, suddenly you wind up in a terrible storm and there's no light, no light, sun nor stars. No, no light by day, no light by night. It's a terrible storm, and, and you are just heaving on the sea of life. And it's up and down and back and forth. And, and you know what you always think? Maybe it'll be better tomorrow. Maybe this will let up, you know. Uh, and, you know, when you go day after day after day after day after day, and it doesn't let up. But Paul was in the will of God. It didn't, it didn't say that Paul experienced this every year. But boy, there was once in his life where he, he reached a point. Paul was not mad at God. Paul was not cussing God. Paul was not cussing those around him. But Paul thought, I think I'm going to die. I think this is the end of the road. I don't think, I don't think I'm going to make it. But in the darkest hour, verse 23. For there stood by me this night, the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. God speaks to him in that darkest hour, and do you know that storm continued for another two weeks? You know, sometimes we think, you know, if we get a word from the Lord, you know, and you know how this is, you're reading your Bible and, and you're, you know, you're reading just your scheduled reading and, and you're in a dark time and man, God speaks to you and you get really encouraged. And, um, and, but the problem is what if the, what if the storm continues? You know, God himself in that dark hour suddenly makes himself felt and known and heard. And he tells Paul, he said, Paul, I haven't changed my mind. You're, you're still going to Rome. You're going to make it. But that storm is going to last two more weeks. Look at the, look at the wording, verse 22. And now I exhort you. He's talking to the, to the, to the guys on, on board. He says, I exhort you to be of good cheer. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. And then he says, that night, the angel of God had stood by him, verse 24, saying, Fear not, Paul, for thou must be brought before Caesar. One of the things that God had promised to Paul and about Paul from the very beginning. Uh, you know, Paul had a destination. Uh, you have, if you're a believer, man, you got a destination. And I'm not talking about heaven, although that is your ultimate destination. Man, God's got a plan. God's got people that he wants you to reach and that are going to come across your path in your lifetime. Paul is on this ship and he's on this ship. There's other times where Paul is with big, important people. But on this ship, he's with the nobodies. He's with the down and outers. He's with some of the worst of humanity. And uh, it's a divine appointment. I mean, by the time this this voyage is over. Everybody on the ship knows who Paul is. And it's not because he, he's he got his preacher button on or his, you know, King James only button, you know, or his, uh, it, it's not because 
He's been, you know, being obnoxious on board. In fact, th this ship's been heaving and going back and forth. And I'm not trying to be crude. I've, I've never experienced this. I had a friend that was on a, on a fishing vessel. And it was supposed to be a delightful trip. You know, one of those you pay good money for. And he's on this ship and on this fishing boat with a bunch of people. It's a tour thing. And he said, they get out there and the wind starts blowing and the boat starts heaving. And he said, there was about 30 or 40 of us on there. And he said, um, he said, there were several of us. And he said, we are all throwing up all over the place. And um, he said, you know, he said, but he said, I, I wanted to get back to shore, but they weren't in a hurry. He said, I reached a point where I didn't care if I lived or died because I knew I was going to go to heaven. And he said, I was just so sick on that ship. You know, almost ever since the first day on this ship, this ship has been rocking all over the place. And yet, in spite of all that, God takes the man that's in his will. And he's able to use him. He's able to override that whole thing. And by the time he's done. Man, what a. What a divine appointment this whole thing has been. And you know why? It's because he's in the will of God. And this storm, this storm was not about killing him. Um, this storm was going to be the tool to reach Julian, the centurion. And, and this, this voyage isn't over at the end, in this chapter. You come to the next chapter. Man, there, Paul is influencing, reaching, shining people all over the place. But God's original promise to him was, you will stand before kings for my sake. He winds up in front of Agrippa. And look where he's headed here. Verse 24. Fear not, Paul. Thou must be brought before Caesar. You know who the Caesar was? It was Nero. You know, crazy Nero. The guy that um, they believe actually set fire to Rome. And he fiddled while it burned. He's the guy that took Christians and had nighttime parties and had Christians on posts in his garden. And he would cover them with tar and set them on fire. That sounds familiar for some reason. He would set them on fire. This is Nero. You know, you think about some of those people in history past and how God has done something to get the gospel to them. You know, you read those stories. You would never know that God sent one of the greatest Christians of all time to testify about Jesus Christ in his presence. I mean, it'd be a rare opportunity to get a hearing with Nero and a fearful opportunity. But there was only one way in the will of God, and that was Paul as a prisoner. He's back in the will of God. And Paul, God says to Paul, Paul, I know you think you're going to die. He says, but you're not. He says, you're going to make it through this storm. Could I tell you today, Christian, if you're in the middle of the darkness and there's a horrible storm in front of you, uh, listen, the God you love, his safety is of the Lord. He cares about your every step. And unless he's determined it's your time to go, you're going to make it through the storm. Just hold his hand. You'll get through the storm. He'll get you through. Be of good cheer, Paul says. If you're in a storm, uh, if, if you believe God, look at the wording. Verse 25. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God. If you believe God, you can be of good cheer. Your good cheer does not have to be dependent on, you know, a raise and on, you know, your investments booming and, um, and whatever it is that you're counting on, you know, um, you can be of good cheer when neither the sun nor the moon in many days have appeared. If you believe God. Look at verse 31. Uh, verse. Look, go to verse 29. They realize they're getting closer to shore. They can't see the shore yet, but there's something about the sea that they can tell they're getting closer. And so they start, they start dropping their sounding. They had a way to, to test the depth. 
and they begin, it's, it's dark, it's midnight. And they begin to, t and as they, as they begin to test the depth, they realize it's getting shallower and shallower. Verse 28 and sounded and found it 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it 15,000 fathoms. Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast out four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. The verse 30. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea, this is the people that are running the ship. You know what they figured? They figured they've had enough and they, they think maybe we can get away. Uh, they're going to bail. Don't you love people that bail? Verse 30. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea under color, as though they would have cast anchors out of the four ship, they're pretending that they're going to mess with the anchors. Verse 31, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. Now watch. Then the soldiers cut the ropes, cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. You know, right now it's reached a point where everybody's listening to Paul. You know, there's nothing like a storm to turn your ear to God. You got somebody you're praying for? And, you know, just it, they're not listening and everything seems really good. Maybe it's time to pray for a storm. Because there's nothing like a storm. You know, in the beginning of the chapter, they just they're just humoring Paul. Now they're not humoring Paul. Now they're listening to Paul. Verse 33. And while the day was coming on. Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that she have tarried, and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. For there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then were they all of good cheer, and they all took some meat. Paul's Christianity shined in the storm. His faith and his good cheer was communicated to them. Well, there's nothing that advertises for Christianity like a happy Christian. There's something about that. And Paul affects, these verses tell us there were 276 men. But how did Paul do that? Primarily through the centurion. Paul's dealing is with the centurion. In other words, through that one man, God began to open that door. Um, you know, sometimes there'll be one person, Christian, that you're going you're gonna to reach, you're going to deal with, you're going to be a witness to. And that one person is going to make all the difference in the world. A lot of you have heard of Dwight D. L. Moody, Dwight L. Moody, and uh, you know he was a great evangelist in the 1800s and and the early 1900s, and he uh, was responsible for leading you know through his preaching thousands and thousands and thousands of people to the Lord. But you know how he got saved, don't you? He worked in a shoe shop as a teenager, and the guy that owned the shoe shop, his name was Kimball, and Kimball loved the Lord. And Kimball was a great guy. And Kimball earned his confidence. And Kimball witnessed a young D.L. Moody every once in a while. And you know, working in the shop, he would see his business habits. And D.L. Moody saw that Kimball was honest. And, and Kimball went the second mile. And Kimball was a real Christian all the time, day and night, at home and at work. And, and one day he thought, I, I think he's telling me the truth. And the man that nobody knows anything about, really, Kimball, led D.L. Moody to the Lord. And D.L. Moody became the tool that reached thousands upon thousands upon thousands during that era for Jesus Christ. And, you know, it was just it was just through one person. You know, who if despise the day of small things? You know, there's going to be somebody you're going to witness to. And uh, I I close with this. I recently, uh, Brother Hemi reminded me of a story that I that actually heard quite a while back. There were some missionaries that went to Sweden. I mean, they were from Sweden. And they went to uh, uh, one of the African countries. Which one was it? Congo. The Congo. They went to the Congo. And uh, the Swedish couple. And it went terrible. 
they couldn't get in the village. They were trying to reach. The chief wouldn't let them in. And the chief uh, chief made him stay out on the, the edge of a, of a hill outside. And two or three times a week, the chief would let this one little boy bring them a chicken from the village because they were having a hard time staying alive. And the chief had a little pity on these crazy, crazy white missionaries that were up on this hillside. And so he'd send a chicken about three times a week. Well, you know what happened? The, the wife died. And um, and there was a I think I believe there was a baby that was involved and the baby died. And the, the missionary, he flipped his lid like he got mad at God. Hello. I'm just telling you, Paul didn't get mad at God in the storm. The mistake of your life. He got mad at God. I mean, he was bitter. You know, I'm here. I can't get in this stinking village. You know, my wife has died. My baby's died. And there was another baby and and uh, it was a daughter. And he he leaves the Congo, goes back home, becomes an atheist. <laughs> what a train of events. That's real life. He becomes, he becomes an atheist because he's so mad at God. He gives up the baby for adoption. She gets adopted. She winds up in the U.S. She grows up there. And one day she gets a, a newsletter from Sweden from a Christian outfit. And she can't read Swedish because she wasn't raised by her dad. She's raised in another country. And uh, somehow somebody got this letter to her. And she was in university at the time. And she took this letter to the university. And she found a professor that could speak Swedish. And he said, she said, what is this? And the professor looked at it and begins to read it to her. And it was the story of this little African boy in the Congo that had got saved. Because many, many years before, this couple had come from a foreign country and been forced to live outside their camp. And that little boy that would come back and forth to that, that hut with the chickens, the, the mom had witnessed to him, told him about Jesus, and, and he got saved. Well, many years had passed and that boy had followed the Lord and he had become a preacher and he had planted churches throughout the Congo and thousands and thousands of people had been converted. And, and this girl's listening to the story and she goes, I, I know who those parents were. She buys a ticket and she flies to Sweden to see her dad. And she takes that letter and she shows her dad. He's still mad at God and he doesn't want to hear it, but she just keeps, for two days, she just keeps pestering him. Of course, she, she became a believer in the U.S. and she, she comes back. She said, Dad, she said, Mom's death was not in vain. Look at what the Lord did. And within a few days, he gets right with God. And she goes back to the Congo and she is honored and you know, the key player in that whole story was that little boy from the Congo, that little boy that was running those chickens back and forth. You know what those missionaries did? They were there just long enough to lead a little boy. And, and you know what we think? Oh, 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 Johnny prayed and asked Jesus to save him. Well, well, that's wonderful, Johnny. Praise the Lord. And you know what? You know, we, we don't put, it's terrible to say it. We don't put a lot of value in that. You know, we, we see that drug addict that gets saved. We see that that, you know, that radical, you know, from some other terrorist outfit. And he gets, we think, oh, wonderful. Praise the Lord. And we, we miss that doorway. And you know what Paul was? Paul was a doorway, that centurion. Paul had an effect on that centurion. You know, there's somebody in your life, Christian, and maybe you're in the middle of that storm, but in the middle of that storm, in the storm, that's why you're there. You're in that storm. And there's somebody that if you'll just stay right with God, you'll shine. And you'll get to heaven someday. And you'll find that a great harvest was reaped from that one person that you reached. Christian, are you in storm? Can I encourage you? Stay right with God. 
Just keep shining. If you'll just believe God in that dark hour, somewhere in the darkness of your storm, he'll make himself real to you. And that doesn't mean the storm will be over. It might go on a little while longer. But you know what? God will be true to his word. And God has a destination for every believer. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. God has a destination for you. Will you take his hand and stop cursing the storm? Stop cursing the storm and hold his hand. You're going to make it. You're going to make it clear to the other side. Let's pray. Lord, bless your truth. God, help your people. God, there may be some here, they don't know you. And God, they're humoring the story of salvation. And Lord, they think they're just going to take their chances. Lord, in Jesus' name, would you put a check in their heart this morning just to let them know, Lord, that a storm awaits them, but the storm for them will be everlasting. But, Lord, they can embrace you, the master of the sea, and be born again this day. Lord, in a crowd this size, there's always somebody, Lord, that's really in darkness somewhere. In Jesus' name. God, you love us. and Lord, the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. And, God, may that child of yours that's in the darkness, Lord, may they hold your hand. And may they be of good cheer. Even in the midst of the storm, Lord, because you will get them to the other side. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if God has spoken to you this morning, the piano's going to play. Why don't you talk to the Lord this morning? Thank you that we can trust thee. Thank you, Lord, that we are in your hands. Lord, we praise your name. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.